Right, so let's get into this discussion now. EFF MP Naledi Chirwa is at the center of a heated debate over her apology for missing the budget speech on the 21st of February. This was due to her baby being sick at the time. Well, Chirwa's public apology led to a wave of disapproval from the public and also discussions about the state of affairs for women in leadership and politics as well as workplace expectations for working mothers. Well, to help us unpack this discussion, we're joined by Tessa Dooms, who's director at Ravonia Circle, and also we're joined in the studio by activist Mandisa Mashiro. But we're going to start the conversation with you, Tessa. Good morning. Thank you so much for speaking to us. I think your initial reaction and just um, your, your thoughts when you saw, number one, the apology, and then just the conversation that then took place on social media and the reaction to that apology letter by Naledi Chiro. Well, I think that the um, apology letter was uh, definitely more extensive than um, I, I predicted the EFF leadership uh, assumed. And I think Naledi was trying to um, signal to the public um, certain things about, you know, how she felt she was treated without saying so. I think it was politically um, her putting out a signal that she didn't feel that um, all of her circumstances were taken into account. There's, there was no reason for a letter that long unless she was trying to make that signal. I do think, um, you know, she wasn't direct about that, but that was the implication. Um, I think that it was meant to stir up um, a response from from the public. And as much as the EFF would say that it's not a, a public matter, it's a matter about um, internal organizational discipline, how um, a political party conducts its affairs does have um, a, a focus or does have a face um, that it gives to the public and the electorate. And so while um, people may not be EFF members, they certainly will always judge political parties on how they conduct themselves, both internally in the organization and facing the public. So um, it was always um, there to kind of give a sense that she, she wanted to have a voice and wanted to be heard, and the public has heard her. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to actually get into what you think it was that, you, that, she, that she was signaling, Tessa, because... You know, it's telling. She talks about um, working until the day before her maternity leave. She talks about um, a four-month-old baby that, that now she's uh, taken to her mother so that she can focus specifically on, 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 on campaigning and assisting the EFF as it walks towards the 29th of May. What is the signal that you think she's giving us? I think the signal is that um, women have always in the workplace had um, these double responsibilities of um, work and care work, that, that, that care work is not as, as valued and is not as considered in terms of how it impacts on other forms of, of work. Um, I, I think she was signaling that she wanted to also be heard, just politically, that um, she wanted her story to be heard and told and that she wasn't just being, she was just absconding from work. Um, that she believed that she had fair reason for why her situation was as it was. Um, but I think the, the main issue is this question of, and that women all over the world deal with, where care work um, is not considered in, um, and its impact on other forms of work is not taken into consideration. Yeah, I think it must be noted, of course, Tessa, that we did reach out to the economic freedom fighters to get their uh, thoughts or their view on this discussion. And, of course, we did hear from the spokesperson, Sinawa Tambo, essentially say that they weren't interested in contributing to the discussion. But let's broaden it a little bit and talk about what, this, what, the, what, the, what the platform and situation really is looking like for women in politics across the board. And for that, we are joined, of course, in studio by Mandy Samashiro, who is a South African politician and an activist in her own right. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. Good morning. Good morning, my lady. Thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure. I think that if you have been watching the political landscape in South <laughs> Africa, what you can't deny is just how hostile the political landscape really can be. Is it, mm -hmm. is, is it, is it a, an environment where a woman really can thrive and operate and, and be safe uh, and also be able to, to run her family at the so same it's time? It's a very toxic space. So also, I'm, I'm not a politician. Yeah. <laughs> I think people I'm doing business with will be concerned okay. that I'm politically exposed. I always have to put that up front. But I don't mind engaging in these conversations because sometimes people feel that I'm being too selfish because I've been turning down a lot of offers to engage in political and social you know, uh, di discourse. But I really don't mind. It's a toxic space. Political environments in South Africa, political parties are toxic. So you know that we won the case in 2020 to have... Um, individuals have the right 
if they uh, so deem fit and their constituencies also uh, allow them to, to contest, precisely to deal with, uh, you know, slowly, gradually transform as, as best as we can mm. um, the, the political environment, which of course was actually, is actually based on very old, outdated, ancient, colonial, imperialist, extremely paternalistic and sexist and very violent and misogynistic, racist, repressive, you know, um, you know, a, a sort of a mode of societal existence at the time when mm. these systems were, were, were created. We inherited a British system that's obviously, you know, based on Roman Dutch law, but also based on a, a, your colonizer's way of governing you. So it's a very, you know, it's a very uh, complicated um, uh, uh, political situation that we, we're sitting with, system of governance, of managing society, the economy, you know, sharing resources amongst, you know, all citizens, etc., and dealing all, with all these post-colonial crises, you know, that we have in all, uh, you know, let's say the global south, really. Uh, I, well, the whole world is, is faced with a political crisis, but ours are a lot more intense because of the resource stealing, but also the cultural, you know, abuse and also, you know, uh, uh, appropriation of African culture and corruption of African culture, and not just African culture. I'm talking all the countries in the global south during the colonial era. So you must look at the political environment and the behavior of political parties and the extremely paternalistic, sexist, violent, misogynistic, trashy, you know, um, sort of patterns of doing things in political parties and making those okay, you know, normalizing them, you know, not normalizing. And so women um, need to understand that when they join political parties, they mm. need to put on their big girl skirts. Mm. Right? What does that mean? It means that you must go in there understanding you're going into a war. Mm. <laughs> I, I, we can't make this any easier for anybody, you know what I mean? I think the biggest mistake that we make, all of us, when I was younger in my 20s and my 30s, before I turned 50, I never, you know, I didn't quite imagine myself as now a more senior woman in society right. who has to give guidance to. But unfortunately, no one can make the pains easier for women. Women are the ones who need to sit down, understand the problem that they are in, especially those who are within the political parties. Right. And then also understand how to then navigate all these tricky areas um, for themselves if they so choose to be in those parties, right? And I'm not, uh, I'm not condoning you. I'm, not, I'm the last person to condone tolerating abuse. I, I personally, I never ever tolerate abuse from anyone. I, I, I'd rather walk away than continue to tolerate abuse. But women, young and old, need to understand and accept the reality. It's almost like yeah. living in South Africa with the poverty and the economic disparities we have. You have to accept the reality and then weave your way out of it uh, and fight the battles, yeah. either within or outside. But you need to put on your big gold pants if let you are a, you a member of a political party yeah. and you're a woman. Let, let me ask you this. Today, this year is a very important year. We're going into what some are saying, the elections that are you know, just as important as 1994. Um, a lot of people are saying. We are known globally as the rape capital of the world. Yeah. Um, our gender-based violence stats are just horrific. And the world knows this about us. It is our reputational blotch and it is ugly. Um, in a year like this one, what is it that political parties need to be saying then to the population of the world um, and the population of women that are sitting in this country saying, well, at some point somebody needs to speak for us. What does that need to look like? So political parties can and do say many things, right, that, uh, that sound good to the ear and that are very comforting when you hear them. But we know that to actually half the time the things they say in public are not really genuinely, I mean, the, the, their intention might be good, but they, they're not really linked with reality and the truth. So it doesn't really matter what political parties say in relation to the woman issue. Uh, often you'll find in, in, in political parties, I mean, there are some that will have a slight maturity in this area, but not good enough to make a, a, a real change. You'll often find that because women generally find themselves economically, uh, let me say excluded, right? right. Because the ex economic exclusion of women out of the business spaces and economic spaces is almost very intentioned. It's almost like designed that way. You know, the boys club thing continues. It doesn't matter the color of the boys. Yeah, they could be Chinese, they could be Indian, they could be uh, Caucasian, they could be African. It doesn't really matter. Right. But there's a boys club thing. There's a, there's a power issue. And when you're in politics, you are there to fight over 
power, right? Like you're there to struggle over positions of power mm -hmm. and how to access that power. And how do you access power in the current world that we live in? Through money. Mm -hmm. Through money, yes, of course, information, you know, how you're able to network, your, your own personal skills, capabilities, your ability to even stand your own ground without fearing you know, for the consequences. Now, being in a country with so much violence already, yeah. the, one of the top three murder capitals of the world, and a police service that has basically collapsed and doesn't really exist if you actually have to be very honest with yourself. The police don't really exist. You're better off protecting yourself or living your life As in a such woman. a way that you avoid getting into dangerous situations because there isn't really anybody who's going to come to your rescue. The police certainly won't. They might come when your body is already limp and dead or you've already been gang raped or raped by a, a single person or whatever has happened. But all of it is post, right? Even in the work situation, in the people who are employees, the labor relations process doesn't really step in during. You have to go through the abuse, collect evidence, and then lodge a case yeah. and then still endure, you know, being name called and being labeled and being sidelined as a woman. And yeah, naturally, being fired mm. from a job where you would have complained about sexual harassment, rape or whatever other form of physical and non-physical abuse. So the point is that when women, and I come back to the point I was making earlier, when women join political parties, they must get it straight in their heads that you are not going into a space that's going to necessarily have programs and plans to nurture you. They're going to say things in public, right? The, the men who are leading these parties, because majority, if not all of them, are obviously led by men. And that's intentional, like I said. Men will pretend like this is a mistake. No, 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 that's intentional. And you know why it is intentional? Because in South Africa, your government is extremely incapable. Let's take the IEC, who okay. should be the regulator of the political space, right? Your government is extremely incapable of genuinely, genuinely supporting women except through a tick box exercise. So even the types of women that might find themselves, you know, moving up the ranks in political parties, in majority of the cases, will not be women who are truly, genuinely very independent and are able to say and do the things that are necessary in order to anchor women's equality in yeah. the space they operate in. I and all the women who tend to want to be agreeable, who tend to want the salary of being right. an MP, an MPL, a council, etc., and who tend to just say, you know what, I just need the salary to survive. And we all know as women, you can't blame us for thinking that way. Yeah. We are left with children and households to take care of by and large. Yeah, and this is, this is part of the challenge, is that when you start speaking about equality of women, whether it be in politics, in business, whatever it may be, there's a sense that that responsibility lies squarely on the shoulders of women uh, that have somehow climbed up the, up the ladder. I mean, Tessa, closing thoughts from you about how whether the EFF or what they need to do to turn this around and also the lesson for other political parties and certainly for the electorate that is watching this year. Yeah, I don't know that the EFF, um, you know, need the response if, if they choose not to have one. I think the EFF's posture will remain as it is, that this is an internal disciplinary um, issue. They're not, you know, venturing into this um, as a substantive issue and even the lady herself um, has asked people to not make this about um, gender and gender equality. So I think the EFF will continue with that posture, but I don't think it's what the EFF does um, that's important in this moment. What's important in this moment is for us to ask a few questions about, um, you know, whether as a society um, and, and as voters we care about these things. Mm. Do we care about women's um, place and position in society in general? Do we care about the way in which women are treated in the workplace? Do we care about women in politics and um, making genuine space for women in politics regardless of their life circumstances? If we care as the electorate, then we have to have a conversation with ourselves and we have to have a conversation with each other about how we respond. Um, politicians and political parties only care about the ways in which voters respond um, at the polls and, um, and when, when we vote in the main um, and care about the sentiment of the people who support them. And yeah. I think it's up to people who support political parties to be vocal about what it is they care about. And so I think we must care more about the way in which women are represented in public and the ways in which women are given space, um, and not even given space, but are able to take up space. Right. Um, I think that um, our political um, culture has been one that's been very masculine and, and was a toxic masculinity many times in the way that um, everybody treats each other. And I think women do get the... the 
the worst end of that stick. Yeah, Tessa, we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately, and I wish we had more time. But an important discussion, and I imagine that South Africa certainly won't stop having it. That's one thing for sure. Tessa Dooms is Director of Programs at Ravonia Circle, and we're also joined in studio by Mandisa Mashiro, uh, activist. Thank you so much uh, to the two ladies for joining us.